There is a plague amongst us in this world, in this country, in this state, and in this very room. A silent foe, sapping away at Americans, depriving us, depriving our people of life, wealth, productivity, and human meaning. It knows no borders and has no boundaries. Men, women, adults, boys, girls, children, and elderly, the youthful, the rich, the poor, and anyone else who is a living, breathing soul can be a victim of this carnage. It wounds a collective as much as it does an individual, and for years has been sidelined as a mere facet of life, a mere fact of the Western utopia that we find ourselves in. This is about something relevant to our circumstance as humans among humans, and especially as young people in an increasingly globalized world. Though we find ourselves more connected than ever, the modern ideas and trends we all share leave us equally more vulnerable than ever. As young people in modern or growing societies, we've accepted heart disease as a thing, a fact of life, a truth. That said, heart disease takes close to 18 million lives annually. It is the number one cause of death in most countries, ranging from the US to Russia to Australia to Brazil to South Africa. This is more than a tragedy, a sorrowing loss of life. Now, I'm a senior in high school. I'm no doctor or rocket scientist, but I am a curious person. So when I was researching heart disease for my capstone diploma in ninth grade, I asked a question to myself, to people around me, parents, teachers, and even cardiology clinics I reached out to, who is responsible for this ongoing issue? Who is responsible for 10-year-olds having fatty streaks in their arteries, medically known as atherosclerosis or the predominant cause of heart disease? Who is responsible for the fact that one in four deaths will be because of heart disease? Who is responsible for this trend with no end in sight? And then I realized that I had the wrong idea. There's no single person or entity who did this to us, who cast this upon us. We did it to ourselves. And this is perhaps part of the reality that I wanted to bring to everyone. We chose it. We accepted it. We didn't come to think that a modernizing world, a utopia in the making, might just kill us. We were blinded by our enthusiasm for the future. Of course, as the young people of this world, we share no blame with the corporations or decision-making of the past. This isn't to say that it's our prerogative to point fingers, but it is and always has been our responsibility to save lives, to save ourselves, to save the people that we care about. So when people think of heart disease, they often think of poor lifestyle choices early on in one's life. But that is a conventional medical view, or as I like to call it, the useless view. The truth is, heart disease is a social issue. It drains the healthcare system, costing America, just one country in this whole equation, $1 billion every single day. The human value impact can't even be quantified. It robs families of their loved ones, and it impedes societal potential. This social issue, in many ways, does not originate in the individual as a medical condition, but it originates in society as a symptom of a lifestyle adopted en masse. And the most regrettable part, this didn't have to happen. It was entirely preventable. It is entirely preventable. However, our efforts thus far had been in vain. In the case of America, the traditional CDC approach of putting up posters about how people should exercise more doesn't solve the problem. The traditional approach of one being prescribed blood pressure medications to solve heart disease doesn't solve heart disease. It doesn't get to the root of the problem. I want you to imagine that society is a room and in this room, there are diseases, conditions, loss, heart disease, all of this trash, this 
ugliness. But instead of taking out the trash as the solution, one decides to suppress a problem by putting paintings on the wall and by putting flowers in the corner to distract from the ugliness. Does this solve the trip? Does this solve the problem of the trash being there? No, right? It's still there. Similarly, our institutions have embellished the ugly room with seemingly beautiful plants and paintings, hoping that they would detract from the ugliness, the ugliness, heart disease, and the beautiful plants, medication. And look where we are now. And so let's try something new. Let me tell you what I've learned. Let me tell you how to prevent and maybe even cure this plague. Let me help you conceptualize the scope of what's really going on. Heart disease is more than just poor lifestyle choices, improper eating, inadequate exercise. It's a manifestation of a reality that we have chosen to ignore. Fixing this quandary is about addressing the root psychology of the modern social intellect. To be succinct, it's about the fact that we know what we're doing wrong. We know we should, on average, exercise more that we should, on average, lower our sodium and processed food intake. But there's something so deeply ingrained in the Western mind that isn't so easily identifiable. And this conviction has been my personal guiding light in the course of my research career. And I don't mean research in terms of publications, PubMed articles, or any other pretentious P-words. I mean research in terms of scouring hundreds of surveys I created that parents filled out to find an answer. Is it intergenerational habits? Is it passed down? Why are people still getting heart disease when they clearly know what they're doing wrong and what they should be doing as the literature indicates? Now to everyone in this room, Raise your hand if you know that physical activity is important to prevent heart disease. Keep it up if you know that eating fruits and vegetables is important to prevent heart disease. See what I mean? It's not that we don't know how to stop heart disease biologically. Even elementary school students know what they should and shouldn't be doing. It's not a lack of knowledge. It's that telling people what they should do simply doesn't work. Now we can speculate as to why that is, but I think it's besides the point. If the answers for the social issue aren't in the medical history, the medical predisposition of the individual, then maybe it's somewhere else. And here's what I think. Everything that causes heart disease boils down to psychology. And this is what I realized for my research, nonprofit work, and playing interaction with parents in the waiting rooms of pediatric clinics. If you can find the specific mental pathway, the flaw in our shared mental framework, the shortcoming of a psychology that we all share, you can cure the hearts of the next generation. You can save millions of lives. To identify the psychology, we return to the individual. Even though this is a social problem, we can only solve it by forgetting statistics and critically examining the individual. So here's my stab at the psychology. For most individuals, there's no middle step, no deliberation to allow the knowledge that we clearly have to sink in and influence our immediate actions. There's no buffer zone in between thought and act to allow our existing store of basic facts, remember the hand raising, to actually have a say in the final outcome of what we end up doing. So no, it's not about intergenerational habits or an inherently human flaw. It's about how certain aspects of society, certain constructs, all inculcate the same flawed psychology in us when it comes to making certain lifestyle choices. Now that we know what the problem is, the fact that our actions are clear reflections of our impulses, and that there is no middle step that offers a detour in that habitual process, we can take certain actions to repair that middle step and allow what we know to ultimately influence our actions. So we've lost the middle step in between impulse and action. 
Now, if this sort of instant gratification is a problem solution, seems anticlimactic, that's because it usually is. It's usually left at that. Well, I'm not a preacher, I'm a student. I want data, evidence, logic. And I bet you do too. What good is a recommendation if you haven't the slightest idea what to do about it? Enter the identify, think, and predict strategy designed with the input of healthcare professionals to outwit our modern programming and restore that middle step. Firstly, identify. Identify the action that you're about to take. Are you about to drink three cans of cola? Are you about to devour two entire pizzas? Identify that. Secondly, just think. Once you have identified what the action is, think about said action and consider two things. Is this objectively good or objectively bad? Is skipping out on exercise for the 12th day in a row good or is it bad? Don't think too far and don't think too hard. Just make one definitive statement in your mind based off of your goodwill logic. Lastly, predict. Once you know what it is you're about to do or not do, and you know if it's good or bad, predict how you will feel. We're often told to think about the consequences of our actions, but that's generic and doesn't necessarily help. Instead, predict how you will feel, not for some vague concept of some transcendent consequences, but for yourself, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later. If you do this action, Will you feel good after it or guilty after it? Will you feel healthy and motivated after it or guilty and unmotivated after it? The identify, think, and predict strategy will at first be a conscious effort, and it may take a few tries to be successful. But over time, like all other things do, it will sink into the subconscious and become a natural part of the flow from impulse to action as a middle step, a detour. This simple strategy allows for what we know to sink in so that we're not blindly doing things without our full commitment of knowledge and intention. Of course, there are more nuanced ways of viewing the whole problem, but I do believe that being intentional is at the core. Of course, I don't want to be ignorant. There are other factors. There's congenital heart disease. Some people genuinely don't know what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad for their body. I think that with respect to this, Traditional programs of raising awareness and disseminating basic information to the public should still exist. There are also socioeconomic factors. Research in the field clearly indicates that some families purposely limit their food expenditure due to the high cost of certain foods, organic foods. This has a particular effect on marginalized communities. But I don't think that clashes with my fundamental point. If anything, it means we must advocate for programs in systemic changes that can build on a middle step psychology approach and allow people to have the same options. Now, when I refer to identify, think, predict, ITP as a strategy or a method, that was kind of a lie. It's far more than that. The truth is, ITP is a preliminary social experiment. We know what the psychology is because it can't be anything else operating under the alternative, the status quo, that heart disease is just another medical issue, is killing people as we speak. And now you have a solution. Identify, think, and predict. Give it a try. See if you are more intentional. And remember, that's how we were meant to be, intentional. I am more than ecstatic to see how this strategy pans out in both my research and hopefully in all of your lovely lives. But before I finish, remember, being intentional does far more than just save lives. It makes them beautiful. Thank you for your time. Christ, oh my.